Republican. On election night 2024, something extraordinary happened. At midnight, while CNN and Fox were still calling the race too close to call, a prediction market called Poly Market was already declaring the winner. Donald Trump has won the presidency for a second time. This wasn't an anomaly. It happened all the time in the history of elections. Polls and betting markets often told entirely different stories. And in sports, we've seen it too. In 2015, experts famously set Leicester City's Premier League odds at 5,000 to one. A total long shot. But the money flooded in to take this bet and swung the odds to just 10 to one as the game approached. And they ended up winning. The greatest upset in sports history was somehow predicted by these betting markets. So in what should you trust? The polls and expert analysis or the money? And can we trust something that money can manipulate? To understand prediction markets, we can begin with an ancient betting market you're probably a part of without even realizing it. Insurance markets. Think of them as buying lottery tickets for bad events. Number nine. You're essentially betting that you might have an accident. The insurance company takes the opposite side of that bet. If you crash your car, you win and collect a payout. If you don't crash, the insurance company wins. And this is how all insurance works, whether for a TV or your life. The riskier the driver, the more they contribute to the pile. And they charge everyone enough to cover the payouts to the winners, in this case, the bad drivers. And of course, they charge slightly more than they need to, so the pile of money is slightly bigger than it needs to be to guarantee the insurance company a profit. And interestingly, this profession is not so different than what a bookie does. Which brings us to sports betting, a much more common and visible prediction market. Let's start with the simplest case. Two people betting on a game between equally matched teams. So they agree to put up an equal amount of money, 50 cents each in the pot. Winner gets the whole dollar. This leads to the heart of all betting, money in a pot, and the amount required to enter the pot is proportional to the probability of the outcome. For example, let's say one person's team is weaker and they both agree has around 20% chance of winning. So one person puts 20 cents into the pot, the other puts 80 cents. This means one person is paying 20 cents for the chance of a dollar, four to one odds, since they win four times their money. While the other person is paying 80 cents for a chance of a dollar, one to four odds. But what if they don't agree on these odds? And speaking of which, where do good odds come from in the first place? This is where bookmakers come in. Bookies handle the bets of many people who might not have a friend to bet with. And like an insurance company, bookies need to make sure that no matter who wins, they will have enough money to cover it. Let's imagine Alice is sick of losing her money gambling, so becomes a bookie and opens a betting shop. And let's imagine it's 1969 and coming up on Super Bowl III, Colts versus Jets. And they could have sold 150,000 tickets for this game. Tickets have never been more scarce than they were here in Miami. So people line up to place their bets, and initially Alice sees $86 coming in on the heavily favored Colts and $14 on the Jets. So she sets the prices accordingly. 86 cents for a ticket to win $1 if Colts win, 14 cents for a ticket to win $1 if Jets win. This ensures that after selling the first 100 tickets on both sides, she collects $100. So no matter who wins, she can pay it out. And if she wants to guarantee a profit, she simply charges an extra penny for each ticket. But notice that the flow of money implied the Colts have an 86% chance of winning. This had nothing to do with Alice's opinion on the game. She's simply balancing the money. However, this only works if the new money continues to flow in the same proportion. But in reality, confidence is always in flux, and so new money might start flowing in differently. And Super Bowl III was famous for this, especially how quickly things changed. As the game day approached, money suddenly started flowing heavily towards the underdog Jets. 
this reached a crescendo when the quarterback Joe Namath, who was drunk, boldly guaranteed a win to the press. We beat anybody in the world, and I think we're going to win next Sunday. Yes, Namath is on the hot. He doesn't even predict it. He says, I guarantee a Jet victory. So bookies like Alice had to quickly adjust their prices, moving the price of a Jets bet up and a Colts bet down until the money started flowing back onto the Colts to balance her books to try and equalize the potential payout on each side. And the money was right. And he may go! He's in there! Still scored! The throw, and it is intercepted! Grant intercepted! Intercepted! The game is over! The New York Jets are the world champions! But on that day, it was less of a surprise to those watching the betting markets, as it took everything into account, including expert opinion, passionate and irrational fans, and yes, insider knowledge. This raises a question, why can we trust a diverse crowd of opinions, some informed, some not, some wild guesses? It can be a tough pill to swallow. This is best captured in a famous story of Galton's ox. In 1907, statistician Francis Galton attended a county fair where visitors guessed the weight of an ox. Nearly 800 people submitted estimates with varying expertise. When Galton analyzed the results, he discovered something remarkable. While individual guesses varied widely, the average guess of the entire crowd was 1,197 pounds just one pound off the actual weight, the collective wisdom produced a near perfect answer. And this result is remarkably consistent. Try it. The best answer is always going to be the average of all the guesses. And this phenomenon is precisely why prediction markets are so powerful. They combine the wisdom of crowds with the price discovery mechanism of betting, creating something far more accurate than either alone. To see how this happened, let's go back to the practical problem faced by bookies like Alice, who need to constantly change prices, or odds, to adjust for their risk based on the betting flow. And there is a simple and beautiful solution. Why not just let people who made their bets continue to trade their tickets directly with each other on the open market? And this way, the prices for these $1 tickets can float like a stock price, but between zero and one. And after the event, the winners can go back and cash in their winning tickets with Alice. And historically, this is how prediction markets were born. They emerged multiple times in the context of election betting. For example, let's take the 1916 election between Wilson and Hughes, one of the closest in US history. Imagine initially Alice sells Hughes win tickets for 53 cents and Wilson win tickets for 47 cents, with each ticket paying out $1 if that candidate wins. After selling the initial batch of tickets, Alice's job is done. She can sit back and watch the ticket holders trade directly with each other all day long through a market exchange. And as we've seen, this starts with open outcry pits and then electronic books. But the key to making a market work is every trade is public and anyone can participate. This creates a floating market price that reflects real-time collective belief. And so Alice can let these people trade continuously until the very last moment. After the election ends, Alice honors all winning tickets at $1 each, regardless of what price they just paid in the market. She always had the initial cash to pay out winners, but market price did not matter to her. And this system proved remarkably accurate because the biases on either side cancel each other out. The wisdom of the crowd offers a final measure of the middle. Famously in 1916 election, the New York Times prematurely declared Hughes elected while the betting markets favored Wilson, who ultimately won. And if we zoom out and look at the history of the market from 1889 to 1940 in the US, these prediction markets correctly predicted the winner 100% of the time on election day, something no poll has ever accomplished. And at the time, they were cited as the best predictors. These markets declined in the US after the 1940s due to gambling regulation, 
born out of a fear that prediction markets would swing public opinion and change voting patterns. And this gets back to our key question, how much can we trust something that money can manipulate? As with all market prices, prediction markets incorporate all information. Every poll, every expert opinion, every news story, and yes, insider information. It all flows into the price. But there's something extra special about the market price in a prediction market price. The price is a probability. A ticket selling for 64 cents means the market believes there is a 64% chance of that event happening. Compare this to a stock price, which also takes future events into consideration, but it's a tangle of many factors, and mathematically speaking, they are different things. Remember, a stock price measures the value of something and has no upper bound. Imagine a stock price at $9 suddenly becomes $99, and then $999. It creates a situation where you can have these rapid spikes when excitement blows up. A prediction market, on the other hand, measures probability, and so the price is always bounded and takes the form of a price from zero to a dollar. And realize as price approaches these extremes, the potential profit diminishes rapidly, naturally creating resistance. When the market's at 99% certainty, you're essentially asking people to risk 99 cents to win just one cent. Few traders will take that bet. This natural resistance at both ends creates a more measured price discovery process than we see in traditional stock markets. And so you end up with a system which accurately measures belief in the form of a probability expressed as a price between zero and one dollar. And of course, it's not perfect because nothing is ever sure. Markets reflect what we collectively know, and there will always be things we don't know we don't know. They can only provide confidence levels. And because of this, you can think of a prediction market as a service. Because people not involved in trading in prediction markets can also get value from them by observing the probabilities. Think of it as weather for everything. It's just a news site and a really accurate one. So we're left with a fascinating reality. Prediction markets offer a probabilistic view of future events that often outperform traditional forecasting methods. This raises two critical questions. If you still believe these markets can be easily manipulated and aren't reliable, you're essentially claiming that you know how to beat the market. So how exactly do you outsmart the collective intelligence of thousands of bettors? Can we beat the stock market? But instead, if you believe prediction markets do represent our best source of truth, well, why not let them guide all critical decisions? What happens when we let market mechanism drive things like government policy directly? Either way, whether it's your savings or your society, when markets take control, what could possibly go wrong? A little bit later on after we play our game, the game will be coming up in a moment, right after we pause to bring you these messages. Speaking of how markets process information, this video is sponsored by Brilliant. Just as we saw the market turn collective knowledge into powerful signals, Brilliant turns complex concepts into intuitive understanding through hands-on problem solving. What fascinates me about Brilliant is how they tackle topics like data analysis and probability, and instead of just explaining formulas, you explore real data sets from Airbnb pricing tables to viral trends. Their interactive courses let you build this understanding step by step, whether you're learning to analyze data or code your own predictive models. Support my channel by signing up at brilliant.org slash art of the problem to get 30 days free and 20% off an annual premium subscription.